ladies and gentlemen, dear esteemed viewers of Civil Space TV, the community show webinar. We are back with yet another session of our discussions. Today we have a group of youth leaders and our discussion is the role of youth in promoting peace and democracy. So first and foremost, allow me to introduce my panel. We are going to have Namuli Ndwafibi. She is the RDC of Kasanda District. Um, she was in Luero before that, and she she has uh, this is her second appearance on this particular show, and we're happy that she's always there when we call her. We shall also be joined by Mr. Mulindwa Walid Rubega. Mr. Wal uh, Mr. Rubega is a notorious name for those that follow politics, especially opposition politics. He comes from the Forum for Democratic Change, FDC, where he is the National Youth League leader. We shall also be joined by Ninsima Helen, the Secretary for Female Affairs, Ibanda District, and a member of the Uganda National Students Association. And finally, joining us from the National Unity Platform, where she serves as the Deputy Youth Chairperson for Western Uganda. We have Kaija Dorin, who is going to help us understand the topic, the role of the youth in promoting demo peace and democracy. With that panel, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to start the discussion right now. So we all know democracy. At least we can see it. We can say what makes up democracy. And yet this remains one of the most elusive words, one of the hardest to define. Nations have gone to war over the word democracy. People have laid down their lives and indeed people have lost their lives over the same. People have been jailed. People have been maimed. Genocides have been caused all in the name of democracy. Everybody seems to want democracy. You know that even a country like the one closest to us, the Democratic Republic of Congo, will have the word democracy in its name. Or the People's Republic, the, people, the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, what is popularly known as North Korea. All those countries have the word democracy, which means that they cherish it. China takes it even a notch higher. They call themselves a democratic dictatorship. While dictatorship and democracy seem two opposites, for them they want to have their cake and eat at the same time. So that is what Article 1 of their constitution describes the country as. We know that here in Uganda, we've preached democracy for so long. In 1980, when the NRA was launching its war, they said, they, had, they showed us what um, the 10-point program, and number one, number one of the 10-point program was democracy. Uh, we know that today, the NRM government brags that he has restored democracy, but we know that the democracy in Uganda is questionable just like the democracy in many other places. So ladies and gentlemen, that is it about democracy. Peace is another aspect that we can all define. But we've seen terms of late that peace is not necessarily the absence of war. Meaning that there can be peace in quotes. Okay, there can be no war, but still no peace. So these are the questions we are going to put before these dear esteemed uh, panelists, and we hope that they will answer. So without further ado, I'm going to invite each of the panelists um, answer the questions that I'll put before them. And I'll begin with our dear friend, that is Kaija Doreen. Kaija, in your own words, in your own view, in your own understanding, how do you define the word democracy? As you defined, as you try to give us what internationally or what it is to different countries, when you're defining democracy, countries like China, and all the others. But I think uh, as, uh, as, as we are, or as human beings, like we say, universal human rights, human rights are universal. I think it is the very universal. And therefore, Canada defines its democracy to what China defines it to be, and to what America, all the other continents define it to be, or other countries. Well, uh, from any layman's understanding, of course, we, on, we all know that democracy is briefly about the rule of the people, by the people, and for the people. And therefore, when we are defining democracy and we zero it down to our country, to our communities, to the continent of Africa, and to the world at large. So I think. That is where we should be setting our basics. If we, have, if we are talking of democracy, what is it like with the neighboring countries if we talk of the Great Lakes region? What is it like in the different states? And so, 
we should say one thing, one point on the other end and have a dictatorship in the very same place. Democracy will always be around only if you, are, you don't have a dictator or you don't have a dictatorial regime. So you can't define the democracy that, that is glittering at one end and it is decaying at the other side. So it is suitably clear to our country that as of today, and from the history that we have had, Uganda has all along been fighting and trying to put things to order with the issue of how to bring democracy or how we democratize our country. I should say with the history that serves us and the regime of the people that we have today, in 1980s and the years earlier, they took up arms. And of course, the promise to the people and the will that they had at that time was to see a country that will be freer, free and fair, a country that will be comfortable for everyone, a country where we shall have human rights respected, a country where we shall have the separation of powers. And they delivered it to their liberation, of which it wasn't applied with the practicability when they took power. And therefore, as a country, when we talk of democracy, sometimes we shouldn't be talking about it on the basis of what we have on paper. We should be defining democracy on what we have with the practicability on or, or what we have on grounds. It is impressive that we come to discuss democracy and peace, more so at a time when we are just from elections. You see, there is a saying that you cannot have you, you cannot eat your cake and at the same time have it. With the respect of what has happened, more so with the past election, we can easily define, are we really enjoying democracy or we are in a dictatorial regime? Well, set sorry. Up? Yes, please. If I can just hold you. Um, you're going to first pause it there. We've got your definition. Let me move to the other panelists. Then we shall get back to you for a detailed discussion in a moment. So my, the next panelist is Helen. Is Helen here with us? Let, let him pass first. Yeah. Okay. okay, Helen, uh, just how important is the ideal of democracy for a country um, like Uganda? If you had the casting vote, if you had the final decision to decide, would you choose that Uganda remains in pursuit of democracy or you think some other system can work best for us? Hello? Huh? Are you there, Helen? Okay, uh, let's move to Phoebe, uh, who was with us right from the start. Uh, Phoebe, um, the whole notion of democracy seems to have um, um, uh, seems to have eluded us. We have tried, we have pursued it, but we seem not to be making progress. In fact, there is concern that our own ranking, our own rating, our own progress as far as democracy is concerned is going down, that we are making, uh, we are permitting, we are making losses, and you're not going as far as we should be right now. Um, as someone that works as an RDC and knows some of these things that happen in government, what exactly do you think is the problem with us as a country? Why are we failing to achieve or even retain the basic democracy that we, the basic levels of democracy that we have achieved? Thank, thank you so much, uh, uh, dear viewers and uh, the, the other, the fellow panelists on uh, this, this show. Uh, and I'm also glad that Amor is invited and uh, I always, always try to, 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 to keep up. And thank you so much for the opportunity that Amor is given. Uh, going straight to, to what you told me, uh, the, the, the question you posed towards me, uh, Toko, I feel, personally, I feel um, Africa as a nation, as, as, a, as a continent, in my own perspective, I, I believe we are not ready for democracy. Uh, I have my reasons why. You know, when you look at countries um, that have achieved uh, 
uh, quite a lot of, of, of things. You find that uh, this norm of democracy that most of us don't even know how to define doesn't work for us. That is why you find that uh, we have quite a number of challenges, even in the definition, because everyone understands democracy in their own perspective. You've gone ahead and you've uh, clearly stated that uh, we, 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 have, um, we, we have countries that have embedded uh, the word democracy even in the definition or in the, in the, in the, in the, what? In the way um, they, they, are, they name their countries, but it is actually not practiced. But as Uganda, uh, I believe it's not completed that democracy hasn't been practiced. Even myself, even the leaders of the panelists we have, when you have a state where um, people or you have like um, a control, but to me, that is now I'm trying to define democracy in my own understanding. Uh, the definition uh, of democracy, I define democracy as, um, as a control of an organization um, by a group and where, which has majority of what? Of, by, by majority of its members. So when we have the various elections that have been conducted, when we have uh, elections and uh, uh, politics that has been that is ongoing and we have a group that takes over leadership, whichever way they would have taken it up, then they then we consider that to be what? A democratic country. But as Uganda, there is something that has been done honestly, because you cannot say that we are as we were years back. But generally speaking, when you look at countries like China, you look at countries like uh, North Korea, South Korea, and the rest of the countries in that category, you find that uh, even, even Singapore, if I may, most times you find that some of them, for, for them to be able to get to where they are, there are certain things that had to be done. And in that sense, some of them, that is why we look, we are looking at them as being what? Dictatorial. But we keep having the, the norm of going back and forth in what needs to be done and the definition of democracy. So I believe that as Uganda, yes, we still have a lot to do, especially in terms of democracy, but there are things that we can see. We have elections that are conducted almost every after five years, and uh, people vote, uh, people they feel uh, to, 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 like they, they want to lead them. We have, even right now we're talking about youth. We have youth elections that are, con that are conducted every, every five years. And we believe the youth leaders in their electoral colleges are elected and they vie for various positions, meaning that at least they're given an opportunity to, to, to be able to serve. How they serve, that is another question because we have a lot of issues with the, the way we as youth leaders also conduct because most of us enter or vie for these positions, but we end up not doing what is expected. As that is, I think, a debate for, for another day. But I believe as, as Africa, if you're to look at democracy, I'm one person who believes that Africa wasn't ready for democracy. We still needed, we still had a long way to go. But now that it is here, there are things that have been put in place. The problem is most of these things are not being practiced as they are what? As they are stated. Hello? Yes, Phoebe, you can hear you. I've gone off. I don't know. Can you hear me? Well, I think I'm also, I'm also actually on, in transit. So... You know, excuse me sometimes when I also go off. But I, I, I think I've, I've given my submission, and I believe to me that there, there are challenges with, uh, with democracy, but there are things that have been put forward by the respective countries to, to show that uh, Uganda is, being, is practicing democracy. For example, the, the elections that are carried out every other time. How they are carried out, that is a different story. But at least there are structures, there are things that show that. Uganda is a democratic part, democratic country, and uh, like they, they, now we are talking about youth participation or youth role, youth, youth, the role of youth in democracy and peace, um, uh, in, in democracy and, and what, and, uh, and, and peace at community level. All these, most of the leaders that I have, even the panels, most of them were elected, meaning that we have people who are, democracy is being practiced. So the other issues that come with what democracy is and how it should be practiced, I believe it is that is a debate for another day. But at least so far as I know, we have Uganda as a democratic country, irrespective of the challenges that we are still facing. Back to you, Godwin. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Harad Aradisi. Um, 
I just want to establish, do we have Walid with us right now? I'm the Awachi Apo. Okay. Um, two of the panelists are not, are not yet with us. I hope they'll join us along the way. So, like I said, I am in the field, so I'm going to excuse any background noise. I'll just try to be as audible as I can, so you hear what I say. Um, I'm going to bring back um, Kaija, Kaija from National Unity Platform. Uh, Kaija, given what um, Phobia has just said, in your own analysis of the politics we are playing in Uganda, do you think that given our limited resources, given our circumstances as a country um, and as a people, our, our history and all these things that define us, do you think Uganda is trying across the board, the government, opposition, and all parties involved. Do you think they are trying and doing their best to achieve democracy, despite the lapses here and there? Or you think it's outrightly a case of failure, we are not, we are not achieving anything, we are not making any progress, and perhaps you could why that is the case. Over to you, Kai. Well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think... Uh, 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 Mr. Godwin, in the first place, I said that uh, you can have democracy at play or you cannot have it. So you cannot at one point. The question is, do you think we are trying? But the question should be, now to your side, who should be trying in the first place? Because democracy comes with governance. If you have people in power or the state that is willing to deliver people or that is willing to deliver a country to a democrat, then that means it will be translated into that. But at the same time, if you have a governance system, people at the helm of power, at, at the helm, who are willing to keep people in captivity, to hold you hostage, then you will not have democracy. Uh, Mr. Godwin, I think we should be categorically clear that uh, if by all means we had an accolade to recognize any group of people who have pushed, who have pulled, who, are, who have had the sweat to fight for democracy, it is the young people. With the history that we've had, and where we are today as a country, I should say that it is a blessing in disguise maybe to the people who hold power today that Uganda is one of the countries that, that has the youngest population or growing population. And therefore, when you have such a population that is being held captive by the regime, and on the other side, it is that population that is doing all what it takes to see that they can unveil their country to democracy. That is why Mr. Godwin will see that in the past elections, at least we as the national unity platform, we delivered a candidate or the youngest presidential candidate, who of course the young people with their popular support gathered around him, that is one, that there was effective participation of the young people for them to exercise their right. Otherwise, they would have also thought the otherwise, like the class of 1986, like they did. But the young people, because they feel like it is worth it to deliver this country to a more democratic process than picking guns than they, like they did, they did all what it would to see that they would go into an election, rally behind a candidate of their choice, but still, you saw how the young people were quashed. The young people in the first place, they took up arms in technology. You've seen live feeds in the field through the process of the election. You've seen them everywhere trying to do all what defines a state or, or a country that can prevail to democracy. All their powers have been quashed. That is why today we have families that have orphans we have families that have lost their young people, but in 
the name of fighting to see that this country can be unveiled to the most have played a part that not any other person has done. That is why you see that we've continued to stand out. We've continued to gather our efforts even when we fall as the young people, we have not given up. We have continued to fight on until the last breath. That is why you have thousands under the graves because they were pursuing the will to have democracy in this country. But in the first thing, you see, we have the Bible Proverbs that is in Matthew, where we see the Proverbs when God gave out a man the seeds for him to sow, there are those who scattered on the rock, there are those that were scattered on the path and they were taken up by the birds, and there are those that went on the good soils. And there are far, as a country today where we are, I think we have our seeds on the rocks. And unless as a country, we come to recognize and realize that we can only have democracy when we crush the rocks into particles. I think that is where we are as a country. And we should be so much grateful that the young people with their largest population, with their energy, with their potential, with their will, they have continued to give in all what it would take for them to continue giving, progressing, for them to continue moving, all in the name of fighting for their rights, all in the name of keeping, the, keeping at least in a peaceful way, however much we are being pushed to the wall, we have persevered to see that this country will be one day delivered to the democratic state that we dream of. Still here with us? Yes, yes. Yes, please. Oh, you have, um, I want us to move back to Phoebe. I see Walid is among the attendants. I'm going to request that the admin makes him uh, a panelist so that he can join us. But back to Phoebe. Phoebe, you work as an RDC. You worked in Duero and now you're working in Cassandra. You interact with a lot of youths. Yeah? You interact with a lot of youths and youth groups. Uh, when you interact with these young people, do you feel like they have this passion for democracy? Do you feel like there is a push among the young people in this country to have democracy? Or it's not one of their concerns? Mm, thank you so much. I believe many of them have the passion. They are yearning for democracy. Even by the mere fact that most of them get involved in, uh, in like their participation in, uh, in uh, whatever happens that, that, is, that is in line with democracy. But the only challenge that most of them have is uh, many of them lack the, the, the aspect of uh, seriousness. You find that uh, most of the young people, even when they, they, are, they are forced, most of them can easily be swayed by small, small, small things and uh, some of them tend to deviate. We have, uh, like the previous speaker has said, we have the, the, the biggest population, which is... Um, the young people, but most of these young people don't have money, okay? Many of them, you find that they lack finances. So you find that the fact that this nowadays politics has been monetized so much, you realize that there are very few who can actually speak to what they actually stand for. Many of them have been woodwinked into doing things that are actually against um, perhaps a democracy, or uh, what certain parties stand for. So you cannot, you can, many of them would really want to, to take part, but the commitment and uh, the, 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 the fact that they have to stick to, to, to what they believe in, they find that they have conflicting loyalty uh, in line with uh, the fact that they have, that they cannot sustain, uh, sustain whatever decision they would have made because they also want to survive. So many of them have been compromised and you find that someone who would actually be standing for this particular ideology, you find that many of them end up being bankrupted because of uh, perhaps money and many other reasons. Because now, as, as, as I was, like the example you've given, as I was an artist in the world, we had quite a number of challenges, especially most of, remember what happened 
in uh, the previous election where we had uh, uh, the misfortune, that event that happened. Uh, I might not remember the exact, but I think it was on the 18th or something, where or like the three days riot that cut across. The people who were involved in most of these were young people. And uh, you realize that as, as intelligence, the, the, the information that was being picked by then was uh, you, you realize that some of them were promised something small. So the fact that young people lack, some of them, I believe, some of them lack the ideology to be able to stand for what they believe in and see it up to the end. So with the fact that most of them are also poor, they are, they are, we have a rich human resource, but that is not being utilized. Young people are not engaging in productive work. So many of them, even when they are, being, they are standing and believing in a uh, certain philosophy, you find that some of them get off track because of being woodwinked by, by money. And that is the order of the day. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, um, Phoebe. I see Walid is now with us. Walid joins us from FDC. Uh, Walid, speaking from the perspective of FDC, um, do you think the political parties in Uganda, especially those in the opposition, are doing enough to bring the youths like yourself and other panelists to the fore as far as this push for democracy is concerned? Have we lost Walid again? Okay. Okay. Uh, Sadly, it looks like we've just lost him again. Um, hope he will join us. So I still have Doreen, and I'm restricted to Doreen now. The choice of Doreen and the choice... Now we have Helen as well. So I'm going to put a question to Helen. Uh, Helen, thank you for joining us. Uh, for your first question, thank you know, democracy means one man, one vote. The majority carries yeah. the day when it comes to democracy. Yeah. In Uganda, this has allowed the rich and connected people, who most times tend to be the older people, to buy their way into power, or if I may say more power, using money or coercive means. God, I'm not need. getting you. Uh, do you get me now? Hello? Hello? Yes, Wally, do you get me Hello? now? Hello? Yes, yes, I can get you. Yes. I can get, okay. you. get you. Oh, that's amazing. So I had asked just before you went off that uh, speaking from the perspective of FDC, and let's say the yes. opposition parties in Uganda, do you feel like these parties are doing enough mm. to bring the youth to the fore in their pursuit of democracy? Do you feel like FDC is giving people enough space? Do you feel the same about, say, DP and all these other parties? I know you, you may not know much about them, but I'm speak, you can speak um, entirely from a perspective of your own observation. So just answer for that. Do you think they are doing enough? Do you think there's more that can be done? Or do you think they just sideline the youth altogether? Uh, thank you very much. It is a yes and no question. Answer, sorry. Uh, first of all, uh, good morning, colleagues. Uh, this is Mulindwa Walid Ilvega. I apologize for coming in late. My network uh, is really unstable. I'm struggling a lot. And really, you bear with me. Um, to go to this uh, question suite, um, let me first of all uh, address from uh, the angle of the Forum for Democratic Change Party, which I happen to lead the youth league of the party. I may attest that FDC has given space, enough space to the young people um, uh, to, to, for, for, it, for their issues to be addressed. First of all, the party has platforms and structures the, the issue of uh, um, young people's issues to be addressed is not a... FDC doesn't look at it as a periphery, in a, in a periphery. FDC looks at mainstreaming the young people as one of the core facets of the party. It believes in the young people and even the body structure in the constitution, they are embedded. They have a full representation at the decision-making, at all decision-making tables, right away from the village, where our own elections starts from. In the village, we have a, a component of a, a whole nine executive, nine member executive of the Youth League. And among us, the nine, two members joined the mainstream of the party. The two Youth League, that is the chairperson of the Youth League at the village, and the, and the vice chairperson who has happened to be one of the uh, different sex 
opposite sex. Uh, they represent the youth league at the village. The structure goes up to the district, and even at the national level, we have the national youth league uh, having um, a, a, a direct contact from the village up to the, uh, the, the national. At the national, we are represented uh, in the national delegates conference. We are represented in the national executive committee of the party, that is the top organ of the party that decides on the party. We are given space and we are not looked at as uh, list listening posts. So, and even in every aspect, for example, in every national executive committee of the party, in the in the agenda of the of, of the meeting, we have a report from the youth league. At least there is something that my docket I report on behalf of the of the youth league, and uh, I get the due support from from the party. So my thinking is that the party has a, it doesn't have a lukewarm um, in matters concerning the young people. Even when you look at even our structure now. We have the youngest vice president, deputy president of the party, the Honorable Anna Deke Ebaju. Yes, merely 27 years. She's a deputy president, second in command after Paul, the Patrick, uh, Honorable Patrick Amriato Board. I don't see it uh, in the national resistance movement where one of the first vice chairman or second vice chair person is a, a. So if the party can entrust uh, the young people to be the second in command, in my own view, already there is a, a full um, uh, belief, belief, that, uh, belief that the young people can manage the party. And even and other, uh, uh, um, uh, other portfolios, we have young people occupying in the, on the national executive. So uh, even when I have something that I want to be, uh, I want to push in the national executive committee, I'm assured that I have full backing of fellow young colleagues who will also go, go on to convince other members uh, to, to do. Even in the strategic plan, for example, the party is, the party is undergoing a, a review of our strategy, a five-year strategic plan. We have dedicated the, our strategic plan to be a youth-tailored national strategic plan of the party. So in my own view, the young people is not looked at a periphery in the, part, in the political part of FDC, but maybe in other parties, uh, I may not be at liberty to mention, but I know that even when we go into workshops or training seminars that uh, involves um, uh, into a party participation, you may find that the people in the, in the age bracket of 50, 40s come to, uh, to represent the young people in those uh, kind of arrangements. So, and you wonder whether those parties are short of young people. So, in my own view, uh, what, what, what if this is doing should be replicated to even other political parties. And also, parties must have a deliberate um, uh, program and policy to see that young people are helped to grow. For example, the FDC, we have a leadership academy that is in place, that is going to uh, really roll out the training of young people so that we, 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 first of all, we are going to identify the young people, we are going to train them, and after training, we are going to, to position them for, for leadership position. So that is where I see political parties must invest their energies uh, in, in as far as um, uh, making the young people whose voices are high. Thank you very much. So uh, was Helen, were you able to join? Yes, I was. I am able to join. Okay. Please go ahead and submit. Uh, I didn't hear the question, I think, the network. It's in regards to the role of uh, you as uh, one of the leaders, especially the work you're doing in regards to promoting uh, peace in uh, Western Uganda. Because I realize okay. uh, you are the 
female representative in Ivanda. So we wanted to know your role in promoting as a youth leader and also as someone that has also been a, a vice president in Chambogo. So what role have you played in promoting peace? Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Angela. Yeah, okay. Uh, talking about promoting peace, I think as an individual, like me as Helen cannot do a lot in promoting peace uh, to as far as the whole country, especially if the government is not doing enough. But as, as the Secretary for Female Affairs, promoting peace can start with me doing my duty because one of the things I'm supposed to do is to see that we have good conflict resolution among the, uh, the youth that I lead and if I'm able to see that all the conflicts that arise in the youth committees of Viva and uh, we, can we can resolve the, the, our problems easily then I think we can start there from let's say that the village, the sub-county the district like that. And probably since I'm a national leader as one of the members of the National Youth Council, I can take what I learn as their representative to the National Youth Council in terms of conflict resolution. But as far as the country and uh, the, the country promoting peace in the country, really, I think that the government needs to do more than the individual or at least empower the youth. Because you will realize, I, uh, last time I saw that the government had channeled most of the projects to belong to the UPDF. And that means what? They don't trust the, the government doesn't trust its own people to do, to, to do projects. That means that even if you are channeling or you're trying to promote peace, the government thinks the, YouTube, the UPDF does it better. And the UPDF doesn't have really youth uh, or a lot of youth if you're to see the ranks, we will have people starting from, let's say, 50 onwards. So I think the government needs to first empower the youth. As we do our roles individually on the district or the youth councils, like I belong. Yeah, that's it. Thanks, Thank Angela. Okay, thank you so much, Helen. Uh, maybe the other thing we want to know from you, because uh, other panelists had answered, is just how important is the ideal of democracy for Uganda as a country, if you had the if you had the casting vote on this issue, would you choose that Uganda remains in pursuit of democracy, or you think we should try something else? I, I think for a country me? that has been, I yeah, I get you, Angel. Hello. Yes, we can hear you. Please submit. Yeah, I think for a country that has been led by one person for 35 years, I don't think we have a right to talk about democracy, but not to be misquoted by whoever is listening in from the side of the government. I think, yeah, I believe in democracy. I think that Uganda can, can, can rely on democracy, and I, am not, I, I can't stand and say democracy should leave our country. No, I believe in it, and I, I would want to one day or my children see a country whereby we can vote and people don't say that we have been raged or we have uh, or, or, uh, it's impossible for someone to 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 stand on democracy and say that have been voted in six times as the president or hopefully that we can say that yeah it's genuine and someone can be voted in six times because we've seen mps come back more than once more than thrice so uh, all I think is that the, I, I need to feel the democracy. We need a country whereby, as a country, we can feel that it, it is democratic. And yeah, given a chance to vote, I would vote that Uganda continues with practicing democracy because the majority really can't speak for the minority. And we have decision making happening. Thank you. Thank you so much, Helen. Uh, so we'll go back to uh, we'll go back to Kaija now. So Kaija, to the young people that spent sitting and decided on whether or not democracy is a good thing for the youth, uh, what makes you believe that democracy is the best form of government for the youth of Uganda? 
who make up to 70% of the population? I think, uh, you see, the need for democracy is like uh, the need of, of need to life, you know, or the right to life. And therefore, uh, as a country, as a population, as we truly define democracy, therefore, it is truly incumbent upon the young people to see that this country can be availed to democracy. You see, one golden thing in democracy is that any country that has embraced democracy at one point T, their hates to development are always assured. One thing, the moment there is no civic space for democracy, there is always room or there is always uncertainties for the future. And therefore, as you see today, if we are talking that we would wish to push for democracy or would wish to see democracy prevail, what is it that it takes for a country to have democracy? What is it that it would take for a country like Uganda, for a country that has the youngest population of the young people? How would we manage the same? Because when you look through the window, uncertainties are very high, that at one point, if there is no room for people to exercise their rights, if there is, if rooms, like if any gap is bridged, there is no room for people, you know, to make a decision of, or choice of the leaders that they would wish to have, like you have always seen it in the country. That means it puts a country at stake. And there are far, the country will be finding itself in a position of having to use a lot of energy, a lot of resources, instead of having... Uh, worried, are you still on? Yes. Kaija? Yes. Yes, I'm, I'm Kaija, on. have you finished submitting? Okay, thank you so much. I think she had finished submitting. So now let's go to the RDC cast. The equipment, and, uh, the hospital, which will have tear gas, rock and the hard place. To see that, that is why I say that they. Oh, it was still network. It's okay. Please continue. Kaija, continue, please. Yes, and there are far. It is, it is a need. Kaija, Kaija, please uh, try to look uh, for a place that has uh, better connectivity. Because okay. we are okay, hearing please. a few things. Okay, but now we can hear you. We can hear you. Maybe you can finalize the answer. Because we keep yes, hearing you, then saying, you go off. But you can, now we can hear you, yes. Okay, I was, I was still giving my submission. And I was saying, if we are talking of the young people who should be in the position to pursue democracy, the young people who are unemployed, the young people who are underemployed, the poor people. You see, the question that we should be raising on table is what is it? Like, what does it have to do with someone who is sleeping hungry for democracy? You know, what does it have to do if, if I sleep on an empty stomach? Why should I be discussing about democracy? That is the question that we should be raising on table. And if we are focusing on the young people, I think the best way we should be doing it is have the young people done enough to push for democracy. And indeed they have, and indeed they are still doing the same. That is why the efforts that the young people have put up together, despite of their religion, despite of their tribe, they have held themselves up to keep pushing for a democratic state. Because we know it is only through democracy that we shall see the progress, the development, where the will of the people is respected, where people are held accountable of, the, of what they do in office, where we can see environments that is free of corruption like we are today, where country, those who are corrupt, I give given accolades, those who are corrupt are promoted. So that is why we needed democracy as, I don't know, we, need, we needed it even 
thousand years back, but we are yet to be there. That is why. Okay, thank you so much, Kaija. Now we'll go uh, back to the RDC for a bit. Um, the office of RDCs have continuously been accused, especially during the elections and other times, uh, have been accused of doing a lot of damage in curtailing democracy in Uganda. We've been having democracy a uh, week this uh, last week, and there were many comments that were made by institutions saying that they curtail democracy in Uganda. In particular, some of your colleagues have been accused of stopping all sorts of uh, political engagements, deploying police to stop uh, rallies the time when we are having elections, throwing opposition leaders out of radio stations. I know you've been hearing about all this and uh, you've seen it on TVs. Is there a case of your colleagues overstepping their power, misunderstanding their assignment, or this deliberate move by government to stop these engagement, engagements that they stop for some reason. Uh, one of the things I want to also to explain to you is, uh, as for we're not uh, accusing you in person because we haven't seen you doing this, but we want you to comment about the other RDCs that you've seen doing this because it has been clearly seen on many uh, occasions. But for you as RDC, the time we were in Nuero, Kassanda, we've not heard about this, but to those that you've heard about, what do you think is their motive? Is this a deliberate move by government to stop these engagements that they already stop, or uh, there's another misunderstanding of their assignment? Because we have people like you that don't do these things. So is it a misunderstanding or a deliberate move by government? Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, Angela. Angela, my name is pronounced as Phoebe. Just, just, just a bit. Yes, Phoebe. Just to correct you. Yes. Um, yes. I believe uh, it's true. We, it's unfortunate that we've had been we've been having such occurrences. But just like you said, um, it's not it's not a deliberate move by government because once you are appointed as, as, as you are appointed as an RDC, you basically hold it, 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 your roles are stipulated very clearly in the constitution that gives you the mandate to to take to be the chairperson of security. And also be the chief government monitor of uh, most of the projects, uh, uh, plus other 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 responsibilities. But the challenge we've been facing, or the challenge we've been having, is that just like you have, uh, we've seen the president come out come come out clearly on several occasions, uh, accusing police, accusing the security forces of mishandling. Uh, they should handle because, to be honest with you, we are all human beings and. People make mistakes. The problem, where I see a problem, is uh, uh, just like you, 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 you're given a responsibility, but whatever you do, you find that uh, some people end up misusing the powers they have to, to maybe some of them might be having uh, personal grudges or other other things that are pushing them towards that. But as as I speak, as an RDC, someone who has experience, who has been an RDC for quite some years. Because I joined, uh, I was an appointed as an RDC when I was just 20, 28 years as, as a full RDC, and that is, that is when I went to the world. But I'm sure, Angela, you have never seen me engage in any of these activities. Not that I'm not working, but the issue or the challenge we have is uh, yes, you are an RDC, but sometimes we, we, we misuse the power that is being given to us. And at, at the end of the day, it is government. That, that is blamed for our uh, irresponsible action. But uh, just like I always say, and this time around, I think the, IG, the IGG and uh, uh, the rest, the, 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 they, they were very clear, especially most of uh, the forces and, and government came out clearly. If you have a misconduct on uh, when, you, when you're, you're, you're holding a position of power, you are liable as an individual, not as an institution. So what I would want us to also think about is uh, uh, when, when someone has committed an offense, nowadays it's no longer held on to the institution because those days they would sue institutions like police, like even office of the, the, the office of the presidency. But nowadays, if you commit an offense in the line of duty and you're found guilty, then at some point you're liable as an individual. So 
I would not want to say that uh, RDs are angels. True, there are those ones who are doing well, but there are also those ones who are misusing the power that is given to them, and it's make, it, it's making it's painting a, it's painting a very bad picture, as if government is 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 the one that is pushing them to do that. When you are not RDs in a district, you have all the powers to 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 decide on what needs to be done, but many of us tend to 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 to, to, to act contrary to what should be done yet we actually know what should be done so in other words what i'm saying is that whoever is doing uh, uh, conducting themselves unlawfully or uh, 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 committing any offense in line of duty those ones are held accountable as individuals not as the institution or not as government back to you angela Thank you so much, Madam RDC, uh, Phoebe Namulindwa, RDC Cassandra District. I, I think you answered very, very well. And uh, thanks for the tremendous work you're doing out there in the community, because we keep seeing it. Uh, now we'll go back to uh, Warid. Uh, Warid, uh, the FDC and now People Power have on several occasions been accused of being radical or militant and uh, violent. We've seen it even in papers like in Daily Monitor during uh, 2016 elections where some people accused uh, Desige, the president then, of leading people's children into violence uh, because many activists were arrested and then they noted in the Daily Monitor that while his kids, uh, the, he was leading others into violence while his kids and wife were abroad. Recently, same is also being said of the new president, who is Bobby Wine. Uh, what do you make of these accusations by the people that is in papers? Is there an opposition ag agenda to use and democratic means to get power? Or uh, what is being said is a misquote? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Worried, please. Uh, Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Hello? Yes, we can hear you, Arid. Yes, we can hear, can you, hear you loud and clear. Okay, yes, thank you. Please, we can hear you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I want to debunk the falsehood that is being parroted by mainly uh, those from the ruling party, the NRM. Um, I think it is baseless and even unfounded. Uh, the opposition in general, I haven't seen any op um, leading the bombing of the, of the building or a city. I haven't heard or even seen any opposition leader leading a mass killing. I haven't seen any leader in opposition or member poisoning fellow members of the opposition. So really, unless I've, I've, I've been fed or I've, I've even seen um, those kind of examples, maybe I will be, I, I will actually accept the assertion. But uh, on the other part, it is the NLM which is actually masterminding all these. The offices of the RDCs are all over the place on rampage, arresting people, killing people, maiming people, beating up people, abating violence of the highest order, tear gassing people. I don't know that if you tear gas a peaceful gathering, then that means peace. If all these are being done on orders of the other DCs, all other DCs offices have even political intelligence, they have a political intelligence desk. Those are just really um, uh, who are deployed in that property. Even in, for example, meetings, you may you will find that another DC on his or her own volition order for, 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 for arresting people, even tear gassing pregnant women attending a, a meeting, a meeting of less than 30 people in a room. And you come and say the, 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 the meeting is illegal. Just the meeting of a district executive of the party. We've seen that 
we, we, we saw it happening in uh, in, uh, in 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 Slovakia when Anna Radici ordered uh, for, 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 for for spraying tear gas in a meeting of thirty less than thirty members of the Forum for Democratic Change leaders who are gathered in a hall uh, to to discuss about the progress of their party in the district. So in the meeting, it included the pregnant women. So what kind of violence can we equate more than that? So we've seen even RDCs giving orders that kind of Dr. Kiza the opposition leaders will not speak on so and so radio session within an area. RDCs, I don't think if you, if you, you saw people from addressing people on a way, that, in fact, that we incite violence, it is the state in its full uh, blast that actually are betting this. We've seen the police officers maiming, killing people in body daylight, and even the, the spokesperson of the police comes and even uh, uh, justify the killing of uh, such Ugandans. So, in my own thinking, the, the, the assertion is really uh, useless, is baseless, and uh, really uh, uncalled for. Um, going on the other side of um, opposition agenda, yes, the opposition, ours is not to, um, um, uh, to, to abate violence. Ours is to come with a fully sanitized country. The opposition, it is not true that we don't have an agenda. We, we, already, we have, we have uh, policy books, we have manifestos of uh, political parties, all those are agendas. What if this is promised Uganda that when we are in power, this is what we shall deliver. We have promised a number of things that our NRM has jumped on. For example, in 2001, we promised that if we were elected into government, we were going to, um, uh, to ban the, 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 the implementation of the collection of uh, graduated tax. NRM came and jumped on it and uh, implemented it. That is our own agenda. The, the agenda of uh, uh, saying that we are going to have free compulsory primary and secondary school education. It was our agenda in 2001 manifest of Dr. Kiza Vesige. We repeated the same in 2006. We still have the same view that even we have a better plan See that even we are going to turn uh, the, 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 the curriculum to digital, where we are going to give even laptops to primary school uh, pupils. So all those are our agenda. Even the agenda of Nabanja, which is, she ended up um, using, uh, giving out a hundred thousand. We were going to give a hundred thousand every month per whole household. They copied it and they went and uh, they failed even to implement it. So all those are our, our policy alternative as opposition. So it is really not very fair for somebody to say that if the opposition it, it has nothing in terms of policy, has nothing in terms of alternative. If you go, the problem is that, first of all, we have a population that is naive. We have a government that has done whatever it takes to make the po population unaware of what is going on. It is the reason that why Dr. Besa, this is all over the place, stopping Dr. Besa from addressing, because they don't want that message to be passed on to the, pe to the population. So you may find that due to those uh, issues, those problems, we may be unable to, 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 to expound more, but at least we use the available platforms uh, that we have. For example, this one, the Zoom, in order to link up with the people and to share our agenda. The FDC in, uh, in, in 2015, we launched the policy agenda in Serena, Serena Hotel, when uh, the retired president of FDC the Honorable Retired Major General Wigol Mdisham was still our party president. The FDC, I participated then in the, in the drafting of that document. 
we even launched that document. Even in our, our manifesto of 2006, 2021, 20, was extracted from the police agenda, our police agenda, what, what we believe in as a party. So it is really not, uh, I, I find it even uh, very pedestrian to people who have actually went to school and who have even have, have this, this doesn't have, have an agenda to share to the Ugandan people. So tell us, what did we tell Ugandans when we were campaigning? You mean we were telling Ugandans that we are Museveni again, that Museveni should go? Yes, Museveni should go, but this is our uh, policy. This is our program. If Museveni is gone, this is how we want to transform the country from where it is and to where we want it. The projection, we already have this kind of projection. So um, we want to FDC envisage a country that is well sanitized, that is peaceful. We shall do whatever it takes, even to stop the aggression, outside the aggression we have. Because Uganda, has, at, the, at the moment, we are even sitting on a time bomb. We have, we have, we have problems in Somalia, which we haven't ended. We have problems in Congo, which we have issues with Rwanda. Rwanda can even uh, um, attack us any time. So the FDC party, our FDC led government, if we are in the government, we have such a situation where we are going to reach out to even those countries to change the, 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 the tactic, the strategy. The strategy of aggression, we think, does not work. We don't we need to go into the, the regional, the, 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 those global, whatever, regional supremacy. We need to concentrate more on the people who we think are very and transform. If we can empower the young people, we can turn them into assets. We can turn numbers into opportunities. These are the young people who are the majority. If they are employed, we, we think that a lot of uh, taxes will be collected from them. And it, it is that taxes, that the tax that will be used to transform the economy, to transform the country. So we already have a program, a whole program on everything, a world documented. In, 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 so, and it, even in the parliament, in the parliament, the FDC has a policy agenda that it's moving. That policy agenda is, is really guided by the FDC policy agenda, our members of parliament, which they are, they, they are, they are pushing in that house. So it is really unfortunate for somebody to say that we don't have a policy agenda. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Warid. Uh, but uh, that was very loud and clear. And also, I'll also acknowledge that you do tremendous work as a youth leader and also as an activist. But maybe going back uh, to RDC, is there any uh, comment you'd like to make in regards to the accusations by Warid over uh, offices of RDC uh, always ensuring that they uh, they are the, being the ones accused of inciting violence. Any comment from you, uh, RDC Phoebe? And then also to our um, attendees, we're going to open the debate to the public in, uh, in just five minutes. We'll be opening the debate to you and you'll be able to engage with the panelists, ask any question you have or any uh, supplement. Thank you so much. Let's hear from Madam you. Angela, Madam Angela. Yes, kindly, kindly in a minute before my sister comes in uh, no, to, to justify the time. just one so minute, one minute. Something. Okay, okay. Yes, thank you very much. So to uh, to justify the issue of uh, RDC's offices, you being used as the instruments of coercion. If we saw what happened in Masaka, the issue of Bijambia. If these really offices, useless offices of the other, this is, if those offices were effective in their true meaning, 
if for those people, the employers, uh, spies, intelligence officers in those offices, if they were effective, they would have even gone ahead, went ahead in, in as far as even to arrest those big Gambia perpetrators before even they go on to, to ravage the community. But we saw the Gambia people were all over the place. They were in charge of the security of, 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 of in Masaka and the offices of the Aladisis were mute. We, they were even, that's why even the, the Aladisis were, 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 were changed. Because ideally, they have really changed their kind of task to, politi to political. Instead of providing security to the people, they resorted to politics, how, which are hunting opposition. So if we want to be which hunt, the office of the Allah DC is the best at the game. But if you want better results in terms of security, the office of the Allah DC performs zero. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Warren. Maybe we we'll, uh, don't say perform zero or useless, but we acknowledge the CCG that we continuously work with them. And then there are those that are really doing a great job, like we say, the current, the one we're having on this uh, panel. So we won't say that they are all useless. And uh, I request that we take back that. So maybe, uh, RDC, TB, are you on? Yes, I am, and uh, okay, it's quite unfortunate. Me. It's quite unfortunate, but before I go forward, I beg that Angela, the, the previous panel, is kept back the statement he has said that the offices of the RDC are useless because we are fully constituted uh, and we are given the mandate. Back. And uh, maybe I'm informing all panelists. Let's use language. So that he really hasn't knows. taken it back. Because I, I beg that we change the language. You. We also mind about the language, eh? the language we use. Yes, yeah. We should mind about the language that we use on such for us because we have quite a number of people who are watching us, and I don't want to start uh, talking about the nurturing because that is the problem, the very problem we are having. This country is facing, and we, the young people who are in these offices, are the ones who are thinking that we're going to take the country forward when we we ourselves cannot even lead by example. It's quite unfortunate, but all that said. Angela, like I told you, we have individuals who are our children who are appointed as RDC and they're the ones who are performing these responsibilities. I don't want you to use one scenario of Uganda has been in existence for so many years. The NRM government has been in existence for quite for 30 years and above. This is one of the incidents that have happened. But I don't want you to use it as, 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 as generalized that the whole country has been having people with Gambia and what, what is happening in other countries, like Greater Moray. You look at other, in the north and other, other, and other regions, you mean all RDCs are useless? None of them is doing their role. It is just a scenario of massacre. And what, uh, there's been some... Maybe I think we lost you there. Okay. Hello? Maybe? Uh, now let's get back to Helen. Thank you so much, Bibi, for the comment. And I think we've got it loud and clear. Black sea, so that's what not I everyone. Back property. But now that police have a deliberate move to ensure that we start, start saying we are, we are Ugandans and we have been here into the last two, three months ago. But the country has been moving forward and we have country, we have areas that are safe. Okay, so the, the notion that uh, RDCs are not doing their job and many of them are not happening. Thank you. Okay. Quite, Thank you so quite, much, uh, sad And it is, it is sickening to some of us provide part in doing our mandate as what? As the worker Mandela incident. Okay, or there are, there are minor incidents yeah, where we've had that RDCs misbehave. Just like anything else. And good enough, he has said some of them have been transferred. I don't want to say that it's because, because the president given yesterday his address. He talked about people sleeping on their job. If you do not do what you're supposed to do, then you're, you're sucked. That is, it is it's very clear. So the issue of uh, us not being able to do it, we have some of us who are, who are yes, might be lazy. Some might not be doing what they're supposed to do. But I know we also have those. Right. Thank you so much, Phoebe. So let's go back to Helen. 
uh, Helen, you're still on? Thank you so much, Phoebe. So Helen, uh, democracy is democracy one man, one vote. The majority, the majority carries the day. It's governed all. Uh, Phoebe, uh, Let's have another panelist now. Thank you, Phoebe. So Helen, back to you. The question is uh, in regards to democracy. And as I said, democracy is one man, one vote. The majority carries the day. And in Uganda, this has allowed the rich or connected who tend to be older persons to buy their way into power or more power or using the money they have and coercive means to the detriment of the young people and also the poor. Uh, under the current legal framework, the government or the laws of Uganda have also gone a step ahead to protect vulnerable groups like women, disabled youth. Yet even now we see only a handful of these win elections who get far. So as a female representative, do you think the government should undertake more affirmative action to allow our democracy work for young people and especially the female or the women helen yes yes angela yes 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 uh, definitely i i believe the government should though you know it's one thing to believe and one thing to ask the government and the other for them to actually act on it act on what we want so and my solution to that would be not to wait for the government to actually do that. I, I've, I recommend to the young people to, first of all, join entrepreneurship, join agriculture, and join the workforce, formal and informal, to see that by the time you're joining an election, you have resources of your own. Because if you wait, for example, the youth, you're going to enter an election, and yes, you're both at a certain level. Let's say you're both graduates or you're both still at campus and you're entering youth elections thinking that the people you're competing with you on the same level of campus and what. But one of these kids will have their rich parents somewhere where you won't see. So you're not going to actually come and say this person was rich, but you see them splashing the money that you yourself you don't have. At the end of the day, the, the results will favor whoever had more money than you and... Of course, at the end of the day, once someone has the results, it doesn't matter how they got the results or how they were elected, they are at the end of the day elected. So my recommendation is young people to join the workforces and gain these resources, but also the government should put some regulations on. If, if let's say you know that these are young people joining elections, let's put a limit to how much money, let's say the government or the NRM or other political parties inject into these youth elections. If I'm to take you back to our youth elections last year, I think 2020, we had the NRM government uh, sponsoring NRM flag bearers with 200,000 shillings per delegate, whoever is to vote the NRM to receive 200,000 shillings. Now imagine you're uh, contesting against such a person who has such a backing, for everyone that will vote for them, they have money. You're not going to be able to compete or outcompete these people. And the government should really regulate, especially for the young people. If you want to inject money, inject it in the other constituency MPs, but please, government should regulate how much money goes into the youth and other political parties as well. Because, of course, I can't say that it's only the NRM that is giving. It's, it's, comp it's what? Flag bearers' money. But as well as we might ask the government and all that, as the generation that is coming, I would suggest and recommend that we, we use different ways of competing. Let's not look at finances. Let's look, not look at money as the only way of convincing our voters to vote us. Let's work hard to see that we have better manifestos and actually work on them. Thank you, Angela. Thank you so much. Also, 
Ugandan only a small percentage, a very small indeed of Ugandan leaders hold themselves in discussions of democracy, peace, governance as we see today. In fact, you can bet confidently that uh, we'd have more people from this webinar. Angela, Angela. Hello. Hello. Yes, hi. Angela, you're too low, kindly. Yes, you're too low. Okay, can I'm you like hear you're me too now? low. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can get you. Okay, thank I'm you getting so much, you. Kaisa. So I was saying that only a small percentage of Uganda news involves themselves in discussions on democracy, peace, governance, as we see today. Because in fact, I bet that confident. I bet confidently that would have more people on this webinar if we are discussing, let's say, politics, discussing issues of Anthony Marshall failed to impress uh, the game of Manchester, always come or Arsenal. Uh, so why do you think there are very, there's a small percentage of youth involving themselves in these discussions? What do you think causes this as a youth leader of uh, Western Uganda? Thank you. Okay, uh, Angela, thank you very much. I think uh, in the first place, I think my comment was, we appreciate the efforts that the young people have put up uh, in the push and in their will, with all their potential, with all their will to see that Uganda can be unveiled into democracy. And again, as the young people, you see, when you're talking of democracy, there is one thing that we should be knowing, and you said, why are the young people aren't fully involved into the same? So the thing should be, for all the, the years and the time that the young people have been putting up efforts together, what is it that they have achieved from the same? And look here, as we speak of today, there are, there are thousands or in hundreds of young people who are held incommunicable and they're being persecuted because they hold an alternative to the state or they hold a different ideology to what the people who hold powers today do. Therefore, this should be clear to you why you wouldn't see men of the young people at one point, as you'd think, are not involved in the same. We've seen that in the, first, in the past years uh, with the regular elections that we have been going into, you've seen the numbers of participants or the electorates reducing at some point. There are different reasons to that because if every other time you wake up, make a decision, take your stand through the ballot, and your voice will be explaining to, her, to us why we have various young people in their numbers, trying maybe to look on the other side. Because at some point, they have seen what is happening to those who have spoken about democracy, to those who have asked or who have pushed to see that democracy prevails in this country. And I want to be clear to this. If there is any need for the young people to have their full participation, full involvement into democracy, into the push for democracy, then there is only one thing. It is turning the coin the other side. We can only have the young people participate if we dish the dictator out of power. That is the only way you can give a breath to democracy. And that is why simply the young people, that is why you see thousands of our young people trying to run away from the country of their own. You've seen thousands, every other day there are thousands of young people who will be carrying the little that they have of their luggages to, to the airport to leave this country. That should be, that is, the, that is what the country should be involving into, but there is no discussion about the same. As the young people for, for, for the countries that have looked at the value of the young generation or the young population, it is just unfortunate 
that the young people that we have today, or the young population, the largest population that we have in the country, there is no room for them to exercise anything if there is skilling the young people. We should ask ourselves if the United Nations defines a youth as someone who is aged 15 to 24, we should be asking ourselves, in this country, however much our constitution stipulates or defines a young person as someone who is from 18, aged 18 to 30 years. So the question should be rising here that in this age or that, that space of the age that we are talking about today, which skills have we offered to those young people that at one point they will be in position to be innovative enough, they will be in position to hold their families, they will be in position maybe not to sleep hungry, but every other day that you wake up. That is why you see now there is a trend of people who are crossing from this side to the other side. And why do you think they are doing that? Because they know in the first place that this young population is so desperate, it is hungry, they have nothing to feed. I think you saw the recent past few days of people who are someone who was crossing to the other end, not because that they don't have the will to push for the betterment of their country, they have the will, but because they are sleeping on empty stomach, they cannot at one point keep holding the fight for democracy. Sometimes it goes beyond. They hold. That is why, for we who have been lucky enough to know, to understand, and to know, to realize what is the value of democracy to this country, we have continued to push. We have continued to spread what we would term as the gospel truth to the young people. And indeed, they have not been bad to us. They have rallied their efforts in their big numbers. And I believe not even the guns that are misdirected to this population will overcome their efforts. One day, I believe that the country that we are holding and the population that we are discussing today will, be un will unveil this country to a democratic state. Over to you, Angela. Uh, so now, back to our attendees. We want to first thank you so much for joining this engagement. Uh, informative because we have rich panel, panelists that are giving us a very rich discussion. Uh, so we'd like you to send in your question or uh, any addition, but I'll go now to the Q&A and also see any uh, additions that have been made. I'll start with Dorothy Nanyunga. Dorothy said that uh, then on youth and peace, the government needs a mechanism that really understands the issues leading to conflict issues, like giving opportunities to young people to reach their full potential. One scholar once remarked that the fact that you hold, you hold won't matter to young people if they are hungry. This is not simply the activist mode. As a matter of fact, young people cannot be peaceful without jobs without quality education or quality health. Uh, there have to be opportunities for all to ensure that all people share the national faith. Thank you so much, Dorothy. That is amazing. Uh, Bulinda Agri, Agri said, as youth, we need to make mandatory when we see wrong or inequality or injustice. Speak out because this is our country. This is our democracy that we need to make, protect, and eat, and pass it to our next generation. And then we have a message from uh, one of the UNA leaders, who is uh, Albert Bakasara. I'm happy you joined in from the US. Uh, she says thank you to CCG and to the youth leaders for this great discussion. In my humble in my Passion, opinion, Uganda's journey to true democracy is going to start and end with individual efforts and responsibilities by these youth leaders. For example, how they behave in positions of power that they now hold and how they interact with each other as leaders will go a long way to either furthering Uganda's democracy journey or to continuing the decadence when we 
are currently seeing. My advice to these young people is to not look so much to their elders for solutions. Whether it's democracy or economic empowerment, those people don't have the solutions you are looking for. If they did, by now they would have implemented them. Take charge of your destiny, chart your own path, the future is yours. Please embrace it. And he remains uh, Albert Bakasara, Maryland in the United States of America. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Bakasara. So, uh, any other question or supplement before we give the closing remarks, before the panelists give closing remarks? Okay, for now they are not yet in. So let's go now to uh, RDC, uh, Phoebe Namulindwa, would like to get your concluding remarks. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Angela, for the opportunity that has been given to me. But at me, I believe that the youth, we as the youth have a lot of strength. Youth can be a creative force, a dynamic, uh, a dynamic source of innovation, and they're undoubtedly throughout history. They have undoubtedly throughout history participated, contributed, and even catalyzed important changes in political system, power changing dynamics, and economic activities. This has been done in, uh, like, the youth are also, uh, in various ways, they are, a vital, they are vital stakeholders. We, the youth, are vital stakeholders in peace building and can be agents of change and provide a foundation for rebuilding lives and communities. That's contributing to a more just and peaceful society. We are also a formidable force. The only challenge that we have is that we have not united. We have, most of us don't have a cause, but I believe we've had youth who can actually, youth can cause change Youth can, can demand, just like the, one of the, 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 the listeners from the US has said, you might be looking, we are, we are looking and blaming all these other people. For them, they played their role. They have played their role. That is why they are in power and they have been in power for this role. But you as a, as a youth leader, you as a youth who has been given an opportunity, me as an artist who has been given an opportunity to serve at this age, what am I doing different? to ensure that all what I stand for and all that I believe and I see that is not doing right is actually being what achieved. Let's stop the issue of blame game. Let us also learn to tolerate, be tolerant of other people's opinions. Because if I do not agree with you, that means it doesn't mean that what I'm doing is the right thing. So let us be con co uh, considerate. Let us learn to be patient, tolerant, and also stop being irrational in some of these, these issues. Otherwise, any different from those we are considering to be what? To be oppressors, all those who are not doing anything to this country. Me, I still believe if we stay deliberate, we can, because we have also demonstrated the potential to build bridges across communities um, by working together and helping to manage conflict and promote peace. Otherwise, I thank you so much for the opportunity and I know as someone who has held this position for now, uh, this is this like for some good years and the experience I've achieved, I realize that quite a number of youth can actually become me and all even better if we stop bickering and lamenting and also following in the footsteps of our uh, superiors. Then at some point, we need to think differently, think outside the box and stop lamenting and do be deliberate with the actions we want for this country. For God and my country. Back to you, Wow. Thank you so much, RDC Namlindwa. And I think that as youth, like you said, we can create change or cause change if we are deliberate and uh, if we are united. Thank you so much, Phoebe. So now let's get concluding remarks from Warin. Hello. Can you hear me, Angela? Yes, Warid, I can Hello? hear you loud and clear. I can hear you. Okay, th thank you very much. First of all, uh, on my own behalf and on behalf of the Forum for Democratic Change Party, 
and um, specifically the youth league, we would like to appreciate Center for Constitutional Government Governance, uh, CCG, for providing us uh, this kind of uh, interface, uh, civic, this civic space that has enabled us uh, to share our views. And I also would like to thank you, Madam Asimwe Angela, for the tireless work you are doing. We appreciate. And also colleagues, uh, panelists, so uh, members who have been I, my concluding remarks for uh, the short and the long sort of it, we need to empower, government need to empower young people, need to invest in young people uh, because uh, we are the majority. Government need to, um, we need to change this paradigm shift. We need to, we need a paradigm, a paradigm shift from this kind of narrative of uh, coming up with um, empty slogans and empty programs like Ibagagawale, Entandikwa, Youth Live, Youth Fund, Emioga, Polish Modo. Even after five years, government just changed names. Good names if you listen to the entire program. My sister, this is mentioning the program. Anybody can say, no, 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 we are heading to prosperity. But after the program, after, after another five years, they just change the names after the other one having failed. So my thinking is that we need to go, to move beyond the slogan yelling, because they are empty. These programs need to be deliberate, need to be measurable, need to be specific, addressing to the gifts that are affecting the young people, rather than up with these slogans, which are many young people less product at the value of making their youthful age um, um, really a wasted uh, period. So my thinking is that we need to move from uh, the slogan yelling to reality. If we are told we are we are looking at um, bringing the young people, um, improving their livelihood, and uh, also changing. Uh, the, 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 the fortune of this country. Uh, for God and my country, one Uganda, one people. And thank you, Angela. Thank you for the wonderful program. Thank you for the civic space. Uh, as my concluding remarks, uh, I would really, I think, let me just talk to the young people and uh, uh, let, let them know what we can do for ourselves, if, uh, regardless of whether the government will one day come in or whether other countries will one day come in. What can we do for ourselves to better the peace building and democracy for a better generation? Uh, let us create safe spaces for, for youths, for us, for ourselves. For example, the, the, the space you've given us today, it's a wonderful space. Those that have listened in and participated, I'm sure they've gained. We can continue creating such spaces, participating in such spaces. We, we can enhance our own peace building knowledge and skills. We don't need to really wait for the government to go to a library and grab a book, to go to, to the internet and grab a book and read about what other youth are doing in other countries. For peace building and democracy, we can strengthen monitoring and evaluation of what is happening in other countries, what is happening in our own country. You don't need the government to first empower you to ask questions, to go out and research and find out these programs that Walid was talking about. How can I gain from them? Even when you think that they're not going to, to let's say, you, you can gain something from them. So let's continue to strengthen our monitoring and evaluation. And lastly, we can promote our intergenerational exchange with the, with the older people. We, I, I know we are youth and we have all the ego and what, but these older people have the experience that we need. As one author once said, that young people alone by no means have the answers to the challenges the world and communities around the world are facing, but neither do the older generations. By bringing together the vision of young people today and the experience of older generations, new answers to challenges are created and I think we can always adopt to that. Thank you, Angela. Thank you for the panelists and everyone that logged in to participate. Hey, thank you so much, Helen. Uh, Now 
Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Angela. We are so much delighted uh, for the platform given to share ideas and exchange our views with uh, different people from different affiliations. Uh, as I started off, I, I think uh, democracy is something that we shouldn't just be debating on. And democracy should be felt. It shouldn't be something that we should be admiring on papers and how it's defined. And therefore, for the largest population of this country that we've been discussing, or the pivotal point of this country, uh, that population that is disproportionately unemployed, uh, we would wish to say a thank you for their resilience for their efforts, for their will to see that this country can be one day prosperous and can one day see the light of what democracy is. To the CCG as the national unity platform, we are so much grateful and we can only make our promise to this country and to this generation that the will, the vigor shall be on and we shall continue to spread the information, share information, and we encourage the young people to make more formations, to share this information that we have with us and to always uphold ourselves when we fall. Because like now, for the many young people who are still incarcerated, Sometimes they may lose hope. Sometimes they may be broken. And sometimes they may think that maybe the world does not matter to them. But there is always a way out in everything that we do. And we believe that the window for democracy is still open and we shall keep pushing for it. Not until one day when we are there. And I want to inform this country that there is only one door to democracy. And that door is if we do away with a dictator. That is when we can think of ushering in democracy in this country. We cannot have the two playing on the same table. We can only have one at a goal. And there are far with their efforts that they will put up together with the information that they will share with all the other people that is not available in this country will continue to grow if we have the will to push for, the, for it. And we encourage all the other people, the adults, the young, or too old to push for democracy, and there is no one who is still so young to push for democracy. It is only the people of this country or the citizens of this country who will have it upon, or it is incumbent themselves to see that we can deliver the best of this country. And if we rally our efforts together, we shall overcome. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Kaiser. Uh, one of the things I think from you, the remarks well, we shouldn't, as young people, just admire or read about democracy, but democracy should be felt, uh, especially by the majority of young people, and that can be done when they start engaging in more possible. Thank you so much uh, for this. And on behalf of the Center for Constitutional Governance, which is a constitutional watchdog and has brought us uh, this conversation with support from Action Aid Uganda. I'd like to thank you so much, uh, exceptional panelists, for the rich discussion and also uh, the knowledge you brought on board, and also for the attendees. Thank you so much for being part of this conversation and the role of youth uh, in promoting peace and democracy. And we know that with all the submissions that have been made, as young people, all the youth who are the majority in Uganda will do something about it. I uh, want to remind you that this show will be aired on Civic Space TV. 
uh, on Monday next week, starting at 2 p.m. It will be live on all CCG platforms and also on Civic Space TV. So we request you to subscribe to Civic Space TV so that you can always uh, be part of such conversation. Uh, thank you so much. I remain yours, Angela Siwe, for God and my country. Have a blessed week. Thank you.